today in Madrid. We have the honor of the presence of uh, Madrid's mayor, uh, Manuela Carmena, the environment, uh, maritime affairs and fishing uh, European commissioner, Carmelo Bella, and the minister of agriculture, fishing and environment, Mrs. Isabel Garcia Tejerina. With you, uh, the floor is to Manuela Carmena. Good morning, everybody. He is strongly engaged in the take care of the environment because we want to be a green town. <laughs> it's important, very important for us. Effectivamente, it's very important. Actually, it's very important for us to state our commitment to the environment. We are so happy to host this final event of this Green Week here in Madrid. You've done right because you have come to one of the cities that is really committed to become one of the greenest cities. We are it already. We have lots of green spaces a number of uh, surprising number of uh, trees and a total commitment to take care of the environment. That's uh, why we have written a plan, really ambitious, which is plan A, because we are sure that there is no plan B at all. When we speak of the environment, there is no alternative. We must bet it for the full of it, not just half of it. This is the sensibility of this city and of this uh, town, and it's good that the European Commission has uh, recognized it. In this city, we have a real degree of pollution that we don't want. It's been so important that the Commission has canceled a fine that could have been applied to Spain. They have taken into account the fact that although we still haven't met our goals about pollution, we have made a program and we are on the right path. So we thank the European Commission uh, for uh, taking into account our effort and that recognition. And that makes up more. Uh, willfully to develop this plan A, because we know that's the plan we need to make possible that nature has the power it deserves uh, with regards to the individuals. Today is raining, today is a stormy day, nature has decided this for us. We must give her a due homage to nature. Thank you. With you all, Mr. Kamenu Vela, Commissioner for Environment, Fishing and Maritime Affairs of the European Union. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I feel very much welcomed coming back to Spain because honestly here I feel almost in family. <laughs> um, we've had a good cooperation during my, my mandate and I have to thank Isabel, because she was my first contact in, in Spain. I also have to congratulate the mayor for this beautiful Thank city. And we are celebrating, we are celebrating, actually we're closing Green Week 2018. It was an intensive week. We started the opening of the Green Week in the Netherlands, in Utrecht, on, on Monday. Then we, have, we had an intensive green events all over the European Union, but particularly in Brussels, when we had a, a very intensive event of conferences, of meetings, of debates and discussions. And today, I am lucky to be closing the Green Week in, in Madrid. And I think 
Madrid really deserved to be the place where we'll be closing the Green Week because Madrid is also very active in the values of having a green, a green city. The Green Week is the biggest annual event. It has been organized for the last 16 years by DGM. And the whole idea, the objective, is to give space to the citizens to discuss, to make their comments, to debate, to say what is working for them, to complain what is not working for them. And the role of the commission is to listen. Because normally we always talk of cities. When we talk of cities, the first thing that comes to mind is the nice buildings, it's all the traffic, it's the events in that cities. But the thing that makes cities is the citizens. And it, is, it makes no sense to come up with any policies which are not related, which are not coming from the citizens. Unfortunately, we have turned our cities. In the olden days, we used to build cities, we used to build villages for people. In the recent years, we have been building cities for cars. It's always cars take the priority. And I think we have to get back our cities and make them more livable for, for the citizens. When we talk about European cities, that is where some 75% of European citizens live. And if we want to make Europe greener, we have to start by making our cities greener. We have to make certain that our cities are offering a greener quality, a greener quality of, of life. Um, I come from Malta, and uh, the capital of Malta is Valletta. And we always used to refer to Valletta in that days as the city built by gentlemen for gentlemen. But gentlemen were in those days. Today, we don't speak of gentlemen, but we speak of citizens. Maybe because we are lacking gentlemen, I don't know. <laughs> but I think we have to continue in, the, in that trend and make certain that European cities are built, are managed by citizens for, for citizens. The theme of this year's Green Week was <coughs> green cities for a greener future. I have to say it was a very successful green week. I was talking to a number of citizens. I was being taken around in a number of European cities. And I have to say I was very, very much impressed because normally, and my colleagues who are also politicians, at times get the feeling that whenever we sit down to discuss anything, we're always discussing problems, and we're always discussing challenges, and we're always discussing... But I think things are changing, and I have been taken to places not only to discuss problems, but I was being shown solutions. Everywhere I go, everyone was coming up with solutions. In Utrecht, we were discussing, and there was a good participation of the younger generation, all discussing solutions, all presenting solutions. We have been last week or the week before, we were giving Natura 2000 awards, projects that are all coming with solutions. And I see now you are becoming accustomed to winning Natura 2000 <laughs> awards. Last uh, Tuesday, we were awarding the Life Awards. Again, I think Spain had two or three. Awards. And it's very encouraging to see everyone coming up with solutions, especially the younger generation. And when I talk about the environment, I have to talk about the younger generation. I have to talk about young people, young children, because everyone says we have to educate our children we have to make our children aware of the environment. But what I find is that when we talk about the environment, 
the younger generation is much more aware. Mm -hmm. And that is where our future lies. There was a time when we used to say, ah, he's a very nice boy and she's a very nice girl because they listen to their parents. Today, it's the other way around. Today, parents <laughs> listen to their children. And I get parents, my friends coming up to me. Ah, now my child came home and he was explaining how important it is to collect, to separate waste. And I think this is their future. Once I was in a, in a citizen's dialogue and a young, I think he was a student, he said, but the future of Europe, what is the future of Europe? And I turned to him, I said, you are the future of Europe. You are a student, you are a young person. This is your future. Make sure you do not let your future in somebody else's hands because it is their future, but we are in control of their future. And that for me is a big responsibility because if I was doing something for me and I get it wrong, I say, it's my fault and I suffer. But we cannot get things wrong about the future of our citizens because we take the wrong decisions and it's not us only who suffer, but they suffer. So this is the idea behind the, the Green Week. I think we are succeeding. Next year's theme will be green law. Green legislation, which is affecting our cities and what the citizens are getting as benefits from the green legislation and how the citizens are influencing the green legislation and also how citizens are implementing and how they push governments and how they push councils to, to implement. Because very often we get a feedback, yes, we are very happy with the laws and the legislation and especially when it comes to the environment, Eurobarometer shows that 84% of European citizens are very much in favor of European environmental laws. In some cases, for example, on plastics and marine litter, that percentage goes up to some 94, 95. 95 of our citizens are very worried, are very concerned, for example, about plastics in our waste, plastics in our oceans. So, at some, at, at some point in time, we are asking citizens to support us, to support our policies, but our, our policies are there to support the citizens. And I think this is the best match where we have policy makers, where we have those who are legislators, also taking the role of facilitators to help our citizens. So, I thank Madrid especially because they not only support us in all or most of our activities, I, I know that I am in one of the member states who is very much supporting the European Union along with France and Germany. We count a lot on, on Spain as well. So thank you Madrid, thank you Spain, thank you Mayor and thank you Minister for all your support. Thank you very much. And and, the, and the biggest thank you is to the Spanish citizens as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>
cost uh, for this closing of the European Green Week 2018. And thank you also this kind invitation to participate together with the European Commission in this event. European Commission has chosen this year with the uh, slogan uh, Green Cities for a Greener Future this century is the city of the cities. Uh, I belong to a government that is especially worried about the uh, rural areas, but the fact is that uh, most people live in the cities and we are above the average uh, at the European level. So the city is becoming little by little in our natural habitat. These uh, demographic data are linked to other indicators. Cities offer great opportunities because they turned into centers, uh, nervous centers that are the engine of our economy, but also challenges in terms of sustainability, environmental sustainability, and also social exclusion. So public uh, officials have the responsibility to guarantee the fact that the city becomes spaces uh, favoring the living, the cohabitation of everybody combining innovation and sustainability, social, economical, and environmental. In Spain, many of our cities are points of reference about sustainability. Last year, Vitoria was especially highlighted and awarded with the Green Capital Award, uh, European Green Capital Award. Thousands of European cities have joined this uh, major uh, covenant uh, about energy. We are just behind Italy, and together with Italy, we have the most active cities about uh, measures uh, to meet uh, the European Union goals about energy. One third of the uh, carbon and dioxide uh, emissions uh, and take place in the urban spaces are our commitment, uh, institutional commitment, around uh, Paris Agreement wants Spain to reduce some 26% uh, uh, emissions in this sector. So as um, ministry, we are aware that cities have a lot to contribute uh, about solving uh, the climate change, and we are a bill about climate change and energetic energy trans transition that will be discussed. Uh, this, this bill is the ideal framework in which the cities will be at the center of the sustainability policy. This bill will promote the potential of mitigation that exists in the cities, will allow us to analyze the impact uh, uh, touching the cities in order to take the proper measures for their adaptation. About air quality, we are especially worried about that. The commissioner knows that. We can share with Madrid the positive news that came recently from the European Commission, the uh, air plan uh, of the government, together with the air uh, pollution plans of different uh, municipalities, are the demonstration that Spain is taking the uh, adequate measure to guarantee uh, the degrees of air quality uh, to uh, for the proper conservation of our environment. We are totally convinced about that and we will we will go on working to make so that these plans render the fruits and to continue with a policy about air quality. In general, Spain has just punctual problems about air quality, but our uh, our concern is about the cities where most people are concentrated, so it is an environmental concern, but also a healthcare concern because of the amount of inhabitants that are affected by uh, 
phenomena of air pollution. What, another challenge about sustainability that must be addressed by local municipalities is the management of uh, urban waste. The new and ambitious goals <coughs> set by the new pack about circular economy and uh, communitarian directives passed by the uh, Council of Ministers of the European Union as a very uh, challenging uh, goal. Our government is working along these lines to promote policies that improve the quantity and quality of waste uh, recycling. We have designed a series of initiatives that allow us to meet uh, the European goals. First measure is that we have started the process of public participation to modify the waste bill in order to uh, to install the separate collect uh, of uh, waste for 2021. We have uh, issued a decree about the reduction of the consumption of plastic bags uh, and there is a registry of producers. This decree consider it, uh, considers the most uh, challenging goals uh, proposed by the European Commission to fight uh, about this issue of uh, waste collecting. Uh, we decided to go the furthest possible about the set goals. There is a schedule of restriction that ends with the total prohibition uh, of uh, bags and light plastic bags uh, after 21. This, there's also a consideration of sensibilization campaigns so the citizens are informed about where they should deposit their plastic bags, uh, the uh, pernicious effects of their abandon in the nature. In the end, to, co to uh, have uh, success in environmental terms, request a committed society that understand the need to introduce change and change both collective and individual behavior. As the commissioner says, the people that live in the cities uh, are those that are the agents of changes. That's what we have to do every day, this effort to have the environment that we want. I should also say that about uh, waste, uh, the Council of Ministers, Spanish Council of Ministers, will pass the strategy for circular economy for Spain that will fulfill the European strategy launched by the Commissioner and uh, contains a first action plan with 70 measures with uh, some hundred uh, million of euros. This strategy includes uh, a, special, a special chapter uh, about plastic waste in Spain. These steps uh, joins uh, that of the prohibition of uh, non-compostable plastic bags. Through this roadmap we will promote priority lines of action so that there are no plastic in nature to avoid uh, plastic waste in nature. The government's initiatives to improve uh, the management of waste are clear and challenging, but the cities must commit uh, to this uh, so that the uh, collection of uh, urban waste improves in quantity and in quality, and I'm sure that we'll overcome and we'll, and we'll meet the goals we have set ourselves in about this issue. Along this line, another line of action of the government, uh, together with the local municipalities, we are considering the competences of the cities, I want to speak about water management. In 2014, our government uh, issued the plan uh, CREFE about efficiency, about water man management, and it has set some uh, 
2,000 million euros about the uh, depuration of waters. I know we know that this issue concerns the Commission, and our government is doing a great effort to help uh, local authorities to meet their obligations in terms of uh, uh, qu and water quality. I should also speak about uh, the opportunities uh, generated for municipalities and, and for environment management through the new technological uh, tools that offer innovative and sustainable uh, solutions so we can meet our goal, which is a better environment. In Spain, we count on very clear uh, points of reference, Malaga and Santander, uh, in smart cities uh, applying intelligence to the environment. These cities already measure uh, environmental parameters through digital tools. Our government is aware about the importance of promoting these uh, smart cities and in 2015 they launched the Smart Cities Plan. In December 2017 we approved the national strategy of smart territories including the urban uh, areas and the president launched the plan uh, 300%. We are extending uh, up the fiber and f to all uh, municipalities no matter how far they are all municipalities in Spain will have uh, 300 megabytes uh, that will be the tool another tool the government uh, offers to municipalities so that they can meet uh, environmental goals In the end, through communication and uh, information technologies, we will help the local municipalities to improve the efficiency in economic, social, and environmental terms wherever the citizens live. And we understand that this is the future. Sustainable and smart cities will lead us to a better quality of life about air pollution, about waste management, about energy efficiency, and also hydric efficiency. So these are some of the many initiatives of this government uh, supporting the cities to meet their goals and their re uh, environmental responsibilities. And to finish, I should say with pride that in Spain, big uh, number of cities have uh, contributed with solutions to sustainability and social inclusion uh, in the long term. And I think that this discussion about the role of cities and municipal action for sustainable development can uh, encourage new actions, new measures with a potential for transformation, for improvement that would turn a cities into uh, sustainable environments uh, with the goals of uh, environmental sustainability that for us as a government we understand uh, environmental policy as a social policy that also transforms the life of citizens and gives uh, growth opportunities and competitive competitiveness uh, opportunities. So thank you again and congratulations to Madrid for this event. No doubt also congratulations uh, for the Commission for these initiatives because we uh, have adopted the initiative of the uh, Commission. So congratulations commissioners and hopefully, hopefully together we will advance for a greener uh, European Union. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So we are going to finish this first presentation. Now the commissioner together with the mayor, they will have a bilateral meeting. But we will go on here in the hall. Please stay here because we're going to uh, have the director of Media Lab Prado. As you know, Media Lab Prado is a center that has been committed to innovation for a long time, and this event is takes place into the European uh, program DITO, doing 
doing together science that will be uh, presented now. So thanks a lot. Vamos a continuar esta jornada. Os dejo con Marcos García, director de Media Lab Prado. Muchas gracias, Marcos. Adelante. Muchas gracias, Ramón. Eh, buenos días a todos. Bueno, voy a hacer la presentación de Media Lab Prado, que es este centro cultural donde estamos. He titulado la presentación Laboratorios Ciudadanos para Ciudades Más Sostenibles con la idea de que si queremos ciudades más sostenibles, ciudades más verdes, será necesario instrumentos, serán necesarias instituciones en las que las personas, también los ciudadanos, se puedan involucrar pues, en el desarrollo de propuestas y de soluciones. ¿no? Eh, siempre que hay alguien que viene nuevo a Media Lab y tengo que hacerle una presentación, una visita, me gusta mucho cuando el edificio está lleno de vida, con las actividades, los grupos de trabajo, y os voy a poner un vídeo de algunas de esas experiencias. Como veréis, la idea es que grupos de personas con diferentes perfiles se puedan reunir para cooperar, para experimentar juntos, hacer sus propios proyectos. Y ahora vamos a ver en detalle algunos de estos proyectos que os quiero mostrar. Este es un proyecto que es más bien una plataforma en la que se desarrollan infinidad de, de iniciativas y en concreto tiene el objetivo de que eh, los niños puedan diseñar sus propios juguetes en colaboración con padres, con diseñadores y también ambientes, ¿no? eh, lugares para jugar. Esto se ha ido desarrollando a, aquí en Media Lab y hay un espacio ahora permanente donde todos los padres se reúnen por las tardes. Otra plataforma también con, con infinidad de proyectos, este ejemplo del laboratorio de textil en abierto, propuesto también por una eh, antigua compañera mediadora, Elizabeth Lorenzi, en el que se dieron también infinidad de proyectos y aquí nos gustaba mucho la, la colaboración entre distintas generaciones. pues ir probando todas las, todos los proyectos de textil que se vayan haciendo. Ahora voy a presentar algunos ejemplos de proyectos que se han hecho relacionados con la calidad del aire. Este, por ejemplo, es una visualización de datos utilizando eh, la información que ofrece el propio Ayuntamiento de Madrid de las, de, de las distintas estaciones eh, de, de, y de distintos componentes que van cambiando, van evolucionando según, según la hora del día y, y según eh, el, el lugar, ¿no? Hay otro proyecto aquí, en este caso, de Ciencia Ciudadana, que se hizo también hace unos años por el grupo de Internet de las Cosas, eh, que se llamaba el Air Quality Egg, que la idea era eh, utilizar estos dispositivos para que los propios ciudadanos puedan medir y compartir los datos en distintos lugares de la ciudad e ir más allá de los datos que, en este caso, ofrecía, ofrece el Ayuntamiento de Madrid. ¿no? Y aquí, ahora, bueno... Podemos escuchar también a este gorrión que nos acompaña hoy y el proyecto que voy a mostrar eh, sonaba muy parecido. Se llamaba Bisdata, ¿no? Y era una traducción de los datos de las estaciones, en concreto de la estación más cercana que había aquí en, en, en Atocha, una traducción de, de, de los datos sobre la calidad del aire en cantos de pájaros. De tal manera que si de repente sobrepasaba el umbral de lo, de lo recomendado por la Organización Mundial de la Salud, el canto de pájaro empezaba a distorsionar. ¿no? Es lo que le podría pasar a este pobre gorrión si, se, si, si, si respira demasiada contaminación. ¿no? Otro proyecto de, de calidad del aire, este es un proyecto también de ciencia ciudadana, y en este caso lo que hacían es medir los líquenes, que son unos buenos, eh, buenos indicadores ¿no? de, la, de la calidad de, de, del aire en ese punto, y reco recopilar un montón de imágenes que luego se pueden medir a través de esta plataforma que se llama Crowdcrafting, donde se pueden medir estas grandes bases de datos de, de imágenes y, y entonces hacer un mapa de la calidad del aire a partir de los, de los líquenes. Ahora voy a mostrar otro, un, otro proyecto de, de visualización de datos que se hizo recientemente en un, en un taller sobre migraciones. y En este caso cuenta el relato eh, de, los, eh, de los refugiados que tienen que huir de Siria, personificado en, en este caso en, en Zainab, que sería una niña de, de 10 años, eh, y vemos cómo el relato se va contando en la página de la izquierda con un cómic y en la otra página, 
eh, con infografías y datos pues, que detallan la, la magnitud del, del drama. ¿no? Ahora, este es un proyecto que eh, ha ido evolucionando con el tiempo, es muy interesante, que se llama Wikisfera, en el que exploran todas las posibilidades de las tecnologías wiki, ahora la, 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 la colaboración ¿no? y la creación colectiva de conocimiento, y en específico, de cómo en Wikipedia, a través ¿no? de una perspectiva de género, observamos que la participación de las mujeres es pequeña, tanto en la representación de los artículos como en las mujeres que editan la Wikipedia. Y entonces eh, se reúnen todos los lunes y además organizan eh, lo que llaman editatonas, donde se junta un montón de, un montón de gente para mejorar, eh, mejorar Wikipedia. ¿no? De, por ejemplo, eh, han hecho editatonas de mujeres dire directoras de cine, mujeres científicas, eh, mujeres compositoras, mujeres artistas. Y es una labor que realmente, como veis, ayuda a contribuir a, a, a mejorar ¿no? un bien común como Wikipedia. Este eh, es un ejemplo que os suelo poner mucho porque justo aquí cuando pasáis por la calle de Cenicero podéis ver en la fachada de, la, de este edificio, de la antigua serrería, textos originales, ¿no? de, de más o menos de los años 20 del siglo pasado, en el que hay estas letras, estas tipografías, y, y lo que hicimos fue un taller para digitalizarlas, de la que salieron dos fuentes tipográficas libres, que son Serrería Sobre y Serrería Estabagante, y es la que usamos, la Serrería Sobre al menos, para el logo de Media Lab Prado y, y también para esta presentación. Bueno, después de haber hecho un repaso así rápido de, de algunos de los ejemplos para que vierais su diversidad, ahora vamos a ver un, un grupo en concreto. Aquí vemos a, a Fran Díaz, del proyecto Autofabricantes. Él propuso crear un grupo de trabajo, también se ha convertido en una plataforma de, de un montón de, de iniciativas. Y la idea es que, a partir de su propuesta, se sumaron un montón de colaboradores. También se reúnen todas las semanas y el objetivo de este proyecto es diseñar asistencias técnicas, prótesis, manos, para, para niños que, que, que no las tienen, que tienen un muñón y que eh, las necesitan. Generar un contexto de diseño abierto en el que hay... ...hand prótesis for children with no resources, families with no resources. The families and the children co-design with auto fabricantes these processes. There are more than 30 people involved in this project. They also have Super Geese project, which is to design different gadgets for children without hand. Here there are different kinds of tools. Cristina made some tests to using this uh, gadget to play guitar. Many of these projects I've presented to you The goal is to solve a concrete problem, but we also have experimental projects in Media Lab. Autofabricantes collaborate with this group of uh, sound experimentation to create this hand for playing piano. I would like now to define how we call this place or this kind of cultural institution which facilitates a place so that anyone can participate in experimental projects, citizens projects and who document all these projects because they better our common life. We call this kind of space citizens laboratory For us, a citizen laboratory is not just a place, an infrastructure, where you can meet other people, but a citizen laboratory is made also by its communities, makers' communities, and also the ways by which all these people are enabled to come and meet and make things with others. So now I'm going to talk about our ways of doing, the ways of doing we use so that Media Lab is an open place. Our first 
strategy are the open calls. We make a first open calls for projects. We select some of them and after we invite collaborators to join. Yesterday we finished an international workshop which began some months ago with an open call for inhabiting waste. We select eight projects and most interestingly after the selection this is one of the projects, EcoBoat and after the selection of projects we make an open call for collaborators so we create teams this is the beginning of the workshop the teams are being created this is Ismail project from Cameroon which got together with another project by Carlos Corpa so the initial eco boat project which was a boat made by plastic bottles this became this uh, sailing boat who, which we try in Retiro Park you can see in the exhibition another example is this by the gesture made at familial scale so that we can transform organic waste for cooking or for boiling water here is the result it's not totally finished but you can see it downstairs another recycling project is this recycling which is a recycling electronic components for schools so that children may learn electronics this is a team with Miguel Cabanes and the collaborators they've been working with different uh, associations in Madrid they've developed also a guide for teachers and they really enjoy it we also have the prototyping workshops another way of doing by Media Lab is documentation we give a lot of importance to documenting the idea is that these experiments don't remain here in the workshops but that is possible that they replicate somewhere else this is one of the uh, most delicate and important function that we document everything we we put more stress in documenting than in the final result here you can see the guide for a cobot it's a really good guide i really like it this is a guide so that anyone is able to build his or her own uh, boat, her own or his own eco boat. The last strategy we use. The accessible is what we can do through what we call mediation cultural. How to generate a space really hospitalar in which cualquier persona no se sienta se sienta invitada a participar y no se sienta fuera, fuera de lugar donde conectar mundos eh, de la ciencia del arte del diseño el mundo de la, de la administración pública de la academia del activismo para que pueda puedan interactuar de maneras significativas y eso es lo que llamamos eh, mediación ¿no? y es una, una labor que hay que hacer de manera activa ¿no? de escuchar y también de conectar a las distintas personas para que puedan formarse los grupos Entonces, bueno, todo este proyecto último que he mostrado de, de, la, de los residuos forma parte de una iniciativa europea mucho más grande que se llama Doing It Together Science, en la que hay 11 instituciones de, de toda Europa y que forma parte de un, de un, de un proyecto del, del programa SAM, Sa, SWAF, sorry, eh, 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 Ciencia con y para la ciudadanía, eh, y en el que esta idea de la ciencia ciudadana es fundamental, ¿no? O sea, el, eh, cómo diseñar estructuras, instituciones, espacios en los que las personas puedan involucrarse y aportar eh, eh, conocimiento, puedan aportar eh, valor ¿no? a, a proyectos de investigación científica.
proyecto cuenta con, con 11, eh, como decía, 11 socios de toda Europa, eh, tiene una duración de, de tres años y es en este marco en el que se ha celebrado esta jornada, que nos alegramos mucho que se celebre aquí en Madrid y esperamos que tengáis un buen día. Muchas gracias. Hola, sí, muchas gracias Marcos. Eh, a continuación vamos a tener el diálogo ciudadano con el comisario europeo, estará también Inés Abanés, la, la delegada de Medio Ambiente del Ayuntamiento y tenemos también uh, eh, la participación de, de Barcelona, eh, además de Madrid, Frederic, eh, discúlpame, Frederic Ximeno. Eh, paz valiente, pero bueno, estamos eh, esperando a que finalice la reunión bilateral del comisario con Manuela Carmena, de manera que reanudaremos en unos, en unos minutos la, la jornada. Sí, eh, podemos aprovechar este tiempo si hay preguntas sobre Media La Prado, sobre los proyectos que... Nos ha presentado Marcos. Bueno, al final he sido más breve de lo que estaba programado. Si alguien tiene alguna pregunta. What kind of funding do you get for the project you presented? Do you get support, subsidies? How do you finance this? How do you make this small individual project becoming maybe more mainstream and more widely disseminated? Eh, la financiación de Media Lab Prado es eh, prácticamente toda pública. De, Depende del Ayuntamiento de Madrid, es un, es un centro cultural del Ayuntamiento de Madrid. Y luego hay algunos proyectos, como el, el proyecto Doing It Together Science, que es un proyecto europeo. Eh, y luego algunas colaboraciones, eh, también hay algunos ingresos por la, el alquiler de los espacios. Eh, pero bueno, el, yo creo que para la... He eh, entendido que, la, que una parte de la pregunta es cómo poder hacer replicable este modelo. Eh, yo creo que sobre todo hay una, un primer punto de partida que es como de diseño, ¿no? eh, que es pasar de un modelo de políticas culturales más basadas en la transmisión ¿no? a otro eh, que lo que hace es tratar de facilitar un contexto, unas herramientas, unos recursos para que las personas puedan involucrarse en el, en el desarrollo de las propuestas. Entonces, eh, es un, en ese sentido, es un centro cultural que tiene un presupuesto similar a otros eh, que a lo mejor se dedican más a la, pues eso, a la parte más expositiva. ¿no? Eh, nosotros consideramos que es una función también útil, pero que se puede complementar con lugares que respondan también a la necesidad que tenemos las personas de, de participar activamente ¿no? en la creación de, de propuestas. ¿no? Y, bueno, en, en, en concreto, eh, justo estamos trabajando en, en colaboración con otras iniciativas de, del mundo, también eh, en el contexto local en Madrid, en, en, en barrios, ¿no? en, en distintos distritos de la ciudad, y sí que, que consideramos que es una, un, un tipo de funcionamiento que se puede insertar dentro de modelos más tradicionales, no sé, cómo pueda ser la biblioteca, el centro cultural, eh, no sé, un centro de salud incluso. 
cualquier lugar en el que eh, se pueda abrir un espacio donde conectar eh, mundos distintos y cualquiera pueda involucrarse ¿no? en, en el desarrollo de propuestas. Bueno, ya que no hay preguntas, voy a decir una cosa más, que tiene que ver con… Claro, ya había retirado muchas cosas, eh, que precisamente tiene que ver con, con formas de gestión de los recursos naturales, eh, formas tradicionales de gestión de los recursos naturales, formas, la, la gestión de, de los bienes comunes, ¿no? del procomún, cómo las, las comunidades, de manera directa, han sido capaces ¿no? de, de producir, de gestionar ciertos recursos naturales, eh, bosques, pastos, eh, recursos pesqueros, implicándose directamente en, en, la, en la gestión, en el mantenimiento de esos recursos. Y yo creo que esa es, esa es la, la oportunidad que tenemos también, intentar en el, en el contexto urbano eh, lograr una mayor implicación de las personas en la, en la construcción de los, en la generación de los recursos y en, también en el mantenimiento del diseño de, la, de esas comunidades que, lo, que los mantienen. Sería como una de las fuentes de inspiración para pensar formas más sostenibles ¿no? de, de relación con el entorno. Si no, pues hacemos un descanso porque bueno, no quiero yo intervenir en, en nada, pero creo que hay el café. Creo que se va a
Buenos días. Vamos a continuar la jornada con el diálogo con. We are uh, going on with this dialogue with the citizens. Carmen Bella is still here with us, Commissioner, European Commissioner for Agriculture, Fisheries and Maritime Affairs, and we have three cities: Ines Sabanes, Commissioner for the Environment, uh, the. Madrid Municipality of Madrid, Saber Simeno, Commissioner for Ecology of the Barcelona uh, Municipality, Maria Sanchez, Councilwoman for the area for uh, environment and sustainability at the Majalit uh, Municipality. The whole objective of, of this meeting is that we, as a commission, we have to listen to what our citizens are, are telling us. It's not only telling citizens what we are doing and why we are doing it, but we have to listen again from our citizens whether our policies are working, whether they expect less, whether they expect more. And this occasion is linked to the European Green Week. Every year we have a Green Week where the environment takes priority almost in my department over all other areas. We say we have a Green Week every year, but for me every week should be a green week. Every day should be a green week. And we have not just to act as legislators, putting up legislation and legislation and more legislation, but every now and then we have to stop and assess whether our legislation is taking us in the right direction or not. Normally, I would say it is. And I am not the one who is saying this, but from Eurobarometer, it transpires that, for example, when it comes to environmental policies, some 84% of the European citizens think and they support environmental policies. In some areas, there is a higher awareness, there is a higher concern, for example, on plastics and marine litter especially, 94% of our citizens are concerned about plastic and the consequences of plastics. And when they say we are concerned, that means that you have to do something. You have to act. It's not just about plastics, but people are concerned about the air quality that, that they breathe. We very often link air quality to the environment, but it's not just a question of the environment, it's more a question of health as well. When we talk, when I talk about air quality to citizens, when I say pollution from industry, pollution from transport, pollution from power generation, pollution from agricultural practices, is harming the environment. When I say the environment, but when I say it's killing you, if you are a family of six or seven, the probability is that one of you, in the next few days, in the next few months or years, will suffer from some respiratory diseases, from cr some chronic disease, from some... Prima then, when you mention health, they, they listen. Overall, our policies are... We can assess our policies because we are achieving progress in all fronts. We are achieving progress in the circular economy through better waste management. Even more important than managing waste is avoiding it. We are getting progress also on air quality. That doesn't mean that we are stopping here. We will not stop 
until every zone and until every single citizen is breeding the right air quality. And we are making progress also on other environmental issues like uh, oceans and so on. There are issues where we are still lagging behind, not just Europe, but globally when it comes to biodiversity especially, because we have a number of reports saying that globally it's going to be difficult to reach our biodiversity targets, so we take that as we have to work even harder. I will say one last point because normally we always, and I said this this morning, we are always discussing problems, 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 and we see the, gas, the glass always half empty. But in spite of that, I feel very encouraged because lately we have been getting a feedback of some very good solutions. Solutions coming from everywhere, from all over Europe, from the younger generation, from the elder generations on all sectors, on ag agriculture, on how to protect better our biodiversity, how to address sectors like textiles and water and construction in the circular economy, how to make our oceans and protect our oceans uh, in a more sustainable... So, yes, we are getting also a lot, a lot of solutions. But we have to make certain that we have more solutions than we have problems, and that is why we are here, to listen more. This is, I think this is not just a question and answer. If you feel that you don't have a question, but you would want to make a comment, whether it's a good, a positive, a bad comment, go ahead. We are here to listen. And thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm going to introduce myself. I'm going to uh, moderate uh, this debate. I'm Dimitri Garua. I work at the press service of the European Commission here in Madrid. This is a very high, a bit hybrid format here. We are into the European Green Week. We are uh, joining a participative uh, event here, and we are here to enter into a dialogue. This is a cycle of citizens' dialogue. We are organizing throughout Europe by the European Commission. Since 2014, there has been some uh, 500 debates of this kind with commissioners, with high representatives of the uh, European Commission, and there will be another 500 before the 19 elections. Because uh, for environment and sustainable cities, it is impossible to approach these policies without a dialogue and interlocution with uh, the citizens. And this will be a recurring point uh, into this debate. We're going to structure it into blocks. First, uh, most of you want to are here to listen what the panel has to say about the environment. And then the second part will be more open and, like the Commissioner said, we're going to listen to your comments or remarks about the future of Europe, the things we can do better and the things you would like to see. And at every moment I will try not just uh, to have the Commissioner participating, but also to uh, give a uh, the say to the rest of the panelists, but breaking the ice before uh, no jotting down questions, I would set out uh, from the Commissioner words uh, how can we uh, involve uh, the citizens, engage the citizens into these policies as a kind of introduction, uh, any of every one of you could say something about this topic, which are the challenges, and we could also introduce, we could, you could also introduce or present some of the uh, initiatives in your cities about sustainability, but also citizens' involvement, which is, seems a good way of starting the debate. Frederick, uh, good, good morning. Thank you to the municipality and the commission. 
a small previous reflection. We must, we have an urgency because we are, we have a delay about uh, changing a model of the city that should be integrated, green urban infrastructure, climate change, sustainable mobility, equality, zero waste, biodiversity. And we must do this in a moment of social emergency. We shouldn't forget that we have a big job ahead, the, the cities, about a housing problem still to be solved, energy, poverty, education. So it is uh, hard to square the, cycle, the circle, prioritizing social policies, but also it physical change of the model of the city to meet uh, the environmental challenges and to uh, square this circle. We must combine those municipal policies, the things we do in Barcelona, from the public administration, with changes in the habits of the citizens. In Barcelona, mo uh, sustainable mobility, we have developed in a short time 69 new kilometers of uh, bicycle roads. Um, uh, so the citizens must change the habits about mobility, abandoning the car. So it's uh, it is a fit. There, there has to be a, 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 that feedback from the citizens. We are promoting green infrastructure, some new thousand uh, s uh, square meters of green uh, surfaces, green facades, but we must count on the collaboration of the citizens to install this green infrastructure in Madrid, there is this, in Madrid you know, our air quality plan that has measures for, of restriction for the most polluting vehicles. So a deep change of habits by the citizens is also needed. So it's a big, big challenge. We are uh, approaching it with intensity, with passion, but it's a huge huge challenge and we must balance all these questions, um, physical model change, facing the social emergency, the most uh, uh, healthy, uh, vulnerable, health vulnerable uh, citizens, the quality of uh, work shouldn't be left behind with these politics, but they should be in the center, the most vulnerable in the center, and this physical change in the city that must go along uh, with the work on uh, sustainability. Uh, two things about how to engage uh, the citizens. We must listen first, and hence we must be in the neighborhoods, listening to the social agents. Second, it seems obvious, but it's not. We, we must do that with intensity and seriousness. We have a protocol for citizens' participation. Any action by our municipality has a serious participation process behind citizens' initiatives that could be uh, presented in our plenary sessions. We must listen carefully, seriously, intensely co-produce uh, the climate plan uh, for Barcelona. We have co-produced uh, with the citizens, with our digital uh, platform, Decidim, We Decide. It has been used for many participative processes and also with the work with the agents, uh, social agents for sustainability. Co-production from the first moment to think, you know, the 400 actions of the climate plan have been co-produced. And another example, I'm, we are launching a project that it's called uh, Hands to the Green, Manos al Verde, to promote the participation in the renaturation of the city. And we are into an intense process of renaturation, but we must do that with the participation of the citizens. 
and hence we are promoting different actions by which the citizens can also uh, participate in the management of the space. So, listening, informing, I was commenting the commissioner, our health reports we have been doing uh, since uh, three years uh, about health, air pollution, so, with, that, with those reports, uh, people understand that we have a serious uh, environmental, but also personal problem for them. So, listening, informing, co-managing. Now, the floor I is goes to Maria Sanchez from Councilwoman of the Valladolid Municipality. Uh, please, uh, faster. Uh, or shorter because uh, thank you first uh, we are delighted to participate in this forum Valladolid uh, experience uh, I'm gonna tell it and it's good to reflect together about how can we act uh, uh, facing the ecological crisis the Commission has said it uh, we have we are into an ecological crisis so the municipalities must explain people how important it is to take challenging courageous measures about that at for a short term not just longer term the Municipalities have changed uh, since the last uh, municipal election. We have taken seriously these issues, and we must ha we had the obligation to stop some uh, public policies that weren't taking care of air pollution. They w they left in the hands uh, of private uh, and uh, firms uh, public services for the citizens like water services or waste services to uh, convince the people it seems that ecology is a struggle with the easiness uh, we want as citizens we want to go shopping with our car to a mall center uh, we we is recycling is not comfortable this discourse we that is into our heads and it's complex it's complicated to struggle that i agree with the commissioner that we must convince the people that this is a health issue because health goes first people must believe that we must to prove it uh, at municipal policies level but also most effects are uh, becoming real, always more allergies, for instance, and as uh, public structures, we must do that pedagogy. We must involve the people to see that the policies belong to them, and mouth to ear uh, could work, and we must make things easy uh, for the people. From the municipalities, we uh, we we think we say sometimes they don't want traffic restriction. What should we do? So these policies should be transversal. The green thing must be understood by the people as the most comfortable, uh, most desirable way of living. So uh, we, w I think we have met these three premises. We are into green up about uh, urban renaturation. We have call the citizens, the schools, high schools, university to participate with ideas about renaturation, urban, urban gardens, uh, air quality. In Valladolid we have set out an emergency plan about pollution, w controversial. Uh, there are so many cars in Madrid and Barcelona and in Valladolid. Why do we restrict traffic? We must advance about that and orienting policies for, in order to have people, uh, in order for the people to have better conditions, to have public transportation, etc., etc. And if spending ceilings are not helping about that with uh, along the lines of Victoria and Valencia we are we have a bit delay about that but we are doing uh, 
good things with many people participating in our boards and we are thinking how first how does Valladolid eat and how do we want it to eat and fourth energy all, almost all municipal buildings have solar panels solar plagues and um, this municipality is saving a lot in electric energy and we are expanding that uh, savings into social policies so people can believe in municipal policies also there are assortments uh, in our uh, energy contracts so that cooperatives can apply for energy contracts we have remunicipalized uh, the integral uh, cycle of water we have built a public uh, management uh, council before it was a private firm and now we are have more transparency so that the people can understand that uh, water is a precious uh, good and that they can participate about these issues thank you maria now the floor is to the hosts and Medela Prado, thank you for hosting here. Uh, Ines, the floor is to you. We must understand two things that the commissioner has said and the rest of the cities as well. First that we are we have a delay, so we must work in a double direction. We we must work uh, about the emergencies and about the strategy and the horizons that we have set for our cities. This is a basic element. We are under pressure, we know that, to apply, proto to implement protocols, to correct the big problems we have in the cities. And at the same time, in the same direction, we work about strategies for the future among uh, networks of cities, sharing experiences, and we all the social actors that are working on this. this we must uh, have a clear idea that public policies have a lot of room here. There are contradictory interests, of course, but we must make clear that our, our obligation, our commitment is to develop public policies that protect the health of the citizen first, second, protect the quality of life and quality of the space, the democratization and the quality of the urban space, and third, we must understand that changes are an opportunity. This country, this city needs that this transformation that has to be done, that to me is a transformation that goes in the direction of an improvement. It is positive. We must understand that it is an opportunity to apply technology. It is an opportunity to apply in research and to give room to research in our country, in our cities. It is a chance for modernity and to get closer uh, to a better use of public space. It shouldn't be always controversial, always bad for health, etc. All we have the chance all to use the city orderly, in an orderly with quality in orderly manner with quality of life and it's a chance for local economy we shouldn't consider those transformations uh, we shouldn't argue with lobbies these transformations are the real opportunity for change and transformation for cities and for a country. We want our researchers back, we want our young professionals to have a room, a place in this economy where we want social economy to have a place and local economy to have a place. So public policies should go in that direction. If we don't do that, it is a mess. because this contradiction uh, we must order the priority the pyramid of priorities because we do one thing on the contrary 
when we apply protocols what do what do i do with my car well you shouldn't use it you should use public transportation we are we have a pollution emergency so we have we must orient we must counsel and convince as a city we you know our emergencies the intervention of high pollution protocols uh, the acting protocols uh, when there are emergencies when we must restrict traffic all actions about urgencies and emergencies but the strategic work is based in three big elements that we want to feel draw uh, for the city for many years it's not just about work just before elections this is the the big mistake of thinking sustainability just for every four years i'm gonna do this i'm gonna do that no we must agree about thinking cities in different movements and to come to an agreement our three strategies basic strategies is plan a for uh, quality and climate change which has uh, many measures uh, the most sound ones are about mobility, the most known, but also renaturation of the city, also the rehabilitation of uh, uh, houses uh, with efficiency, energy efficiency measures. The most striking ones are mobility related, but but the real one, the, the, the stronger ones are about the change of energy model. The second block uh, will be presented uh, soon is the strategy for uh, waste uh, recycling. In the city, we want to meet uh, the percentage, the goals about recycling and waste reduction and a better uh, order for them. We have already started the selective uh, collection of organic matter. A big city like Madrid is still had, had still not the separation of uh, garbage collection. The third strategy is green zones and biodiversity. This means introducing not just uh, the care of uh, green heritage, but also introducing a concept of a combination of the strategy of the uh, green surfaces and biodiversity. We are working about buildings in the neighborhoods and the city level, rehabilitating with energy efficiency criteria, green covers, promoting that at the, in the neighborhoods, acting uh, about emergencies where we have heat islands, creating uh, ecological uh, ails, uh, reducing that impact. And third, at the city level, our most visible project is the renaturation of the Manzanares River, which has created an explosion of biodiversity, just letting the dams open and letting uh, nature going on, going on with its curse. In the cities, we must change uh, the logic uh, of uh, traditional logic, people live in the city to search for uh, natural spaces in the, in the countryside. This has to go, come back to the cities because most of us live in cities. So now we must renaturalize, renaturalize cities. But do you want to complement? I absolutely agree with what you said is really interesting. I would like to add the need, um, important need, to be consistent among the different administrations. We should avoid the fact that the environmental policy uh, is a political issue, a controversial issue. Like Ines has said, it's not about four years term policies. And the commissioner has said this morning 
the importance of uh, citizen sensibility, education of children. We shouldn't turn people crazy with contradictory messages about whether there is uh, pollution or not. We live in a, in a country with no fiscal, environmental fiscal measures. We shouldn't have municipalities that have the ultimate responsibility of the air quality protection, hydric resources in a frame that doesn't make sense easy for us at the local or regional level. We should row all together in this, the same direction. Now the, the time has come to start uh, the debate itself. Yesterday we were here with uh, colleagues from the European Commission with platforms, NGOs, associations. Now the floor it goes to some platforms that have been working for platforms that want to ask specific questions uh, about uh, yesterday's uh, issues. Uh, I'm going to call to the stage Jesus Perez from Clean uh, Platform, Zero Waste Platform, that has a question. You may stand up or stay, remain. S uh, good morning from the Zero Waste Platform of Madrid, formed by environmental uh, neighborhood uh, associations, we want to ask the Commission which measures are you going to take to ensure that this country is going to meet its duties about recycling and renaturation of at 50% for 2020, because this government since 2012, uh, 2012 has changed the waste bill, has avoided system uh, of uh, wrapping uh, the, uh, uh, management. He has uh, cancelled the schedule for the elimination of plastic bags, but thanks to the European Commission's directive about plastic bags, we, they, they wouldn't have done anything now. The ministry has said that the organic uh, selection is to 2020, so they are not applying policies. And we know that this country is not going to meet the goals uh, requested by the European Commission. So I, we ask the European Commission, what are they going to do for Spain to meet this goal? We also want to say to the European Commission's the this pack about circular economy, the reviewing of the uh, waste uh, legislation haven't requested a lot. We are speaking about circular economy. We want to enlarge the life of products, but they are betting very little about reusing. We should be the core of this change of in the model of production and consumption. And last, we would like to say that we don't understand how can you speak of circular economy and then of incineration and co-incineration. A great percentage of ways we don't know how to do with them. In the Madrid region we are recycling just 12% and 75% goes to incineration. We don't know what to do with the big part of the great part of uh, waste. So we ask the European Commission to solve the problem from the start, from the scratch. They shouldn't let product that can be reused, uh, this, those products shouldn't be sold, shouldn't be marketed. Thank you for each uh, question. I'm I'm gonna let the, not just the Commissioner speak, I don't know, Commissioner uh, a quick reaction about urban waste. ...question because one of the main policies, if I would say the main policy at the moment at the Commission is the policy of circular economy. This is not something we are taking up only at cities level or at European level, but we're taking up the uh, policy of circular economy also at a global level. 
because this is something circular economy is one of the commitments that all the world made in the sustainable development goals. Sustainable development goal number 12 is all about sustainable production and sustainable consumption. As you know, previously, in the previous commission, we had a waste management package. And this commission said this is not enough. We have to have a real circular economy package because what we are after is not managing waste. What we are after is, first of all, avoid waste. How are we going to avoid? By, as you said, introducing reuse more than anything else. We have a hierarchy of the life cycle of products First of all, we have to avoid waste when we are extracting raw material. We have to avoid waste by making certain that when we are designing and producing products, we are inputting in that product the right amount of material and also the right quality of material. The right quality of material that could be recycled later on. For us, waste management in Europe is not, again, not just an environmental issue. Europe is very rich in skills, in labor force, but it is very poor in resources. We are very poor in raw materials. In fact, we have to import six times as much raw material than we consume. So it's an economic, it's economic competitiveness issue as well, because we are importing raw materials from countries with whom then our industry has to compete. The hierarchy that I'm talking about is first of all, again, as I said, we, we redirected our attention not to manage waste, but to avoid it. So avoidance is the first line of attack. Then to reduce waste. And when we're talking about waste, let me give you an example, food waste. In Europe, we are wasting some 40% of our food, which is crazy. Because it's not just the food which we have on the table, which we are throwing away, but all the energy that goes behind producing that food, all the labor, all the man hours of farmers that took that produce to be on our tables. So this is crazy. This is a big problem, but the solution is an individual solution. That's why we need to talk to our citizens. At the moment, Europe is making a lot of global commitments on marine pollution, on plastic pollution, on reducing waste, on reducing carbon emissions. These are all global commitments, but the solutions are individual solutions. When we talk about gas emissions and emissions from transport, it's a global issue. But the solution depends on what car I choose to drive. Food waste is a global issue. But the solution is whether I am buying the right amount, whether I am using, what am I doing, whether I'm reusing or recycling my food. So it's all about individual choices at the end of the day. So avoiding, reducing, reusing. We are making certain that in the design of our products, we extend the lifetime of products. Why? Because some of the products, unfortunately, which we are buying today, have even inbuilt what we call planned obsolescence. You buy a tablet, you buy a mobile phone, and that is programmed to last only three years. And then what do I do with it? I cannot reuse it, I have to throw it away, because either it doesn't work with new applications, with new software, or the battery cannot be charged. So we are addressing these issues of um, obsolescence, planned obsolescence, in the design stage. So reusing is higher up in the hierarchy of even recycling. So then if eventually a product cannot be reused again, then it will go to the next level of recycling. And that is where we get 
the raw material back. And even there, we have rules, regulations, how and what could be recycled. Because at the moment, we have a problem. We have a circular economy, but most of the products that we have on the market are either not recyclable because they have a lot of harmful substances in them and we cannot continue recycling those harmful substances or else they are a nightmare for recyclers. Let me give you one very simple example. I always use the simple of a tube of, uh, I don't mind mentioning it, I've mentioned it before, of Pringles, for example. That tube of Pringles has got at least four materials in it. It has aluminium, it has plastic, it has cardboard, it has this, it has that. So when a recycler gets hold of one of these, this is, I cannot even recycle it. So recycling, we are addressing to make certain that recycling is intentionally kept in mind during the design stage. After recycling, then we have two other levels which we do not encourage. It's the waste to energy where we burn products to get energy. And up to a few years ago, that was even being funded by the European Union. And this commission said no because that's the ultimate thing. What is happening is that many governments invest in waste to energy plants. They don't have enough material to burn. So to justify the investment, they start burning everything, even products which could be recycled. So we said we will not continue uh, supporting waste to energy plants unless we can do it on a, how do you say, case-by-case case, case case basis. Then, at the very last, at the very last of this le level of therapy, we have landfilling. Unfortunately, we still have a number of member states who have a high level of landfilling, and that is the worst that we can do to, to our products. Even there, in the revised, new waste management package that was um, successfully adopted both in Parliament as well as in Council. Full support, I think only one member state in Council didn't even vote against, they abstained, one member state only, but it, it um, received a lot of support. We, in the previous package, it was 15% just as a voluntary, as a guiding level. Now, we have made it compulsory that the maximum amount of landfilling should be no greater than 10% by the year 2035. So, what we are doing, you said, what are we doing for Spain? To, we are doing this all, for all our member states. Obviously, we put targets, when we say we, it's not the Commission, the targets that we put are all agreed by Council and by Parliament. So, Member States cannot have any excuse to say, why are you giving us an infringement? Why are you pushing us? We are pushing you because these are the targets that all of you have agreed. But when I say that, it doesn't mean that our main intention is to go out and, and punish member states. Our aim is to get results. Our aim is to support member states. I always say that we obviously are legislators. That is our job. We are in, in politics and we have to legislate. But that is not enough. Apart from wearing the hat of legislators, we have to wear the hat of facilitators as well. We legislate, but we support you in implementing that, that legislation. I think, I don't know whether this has, has answered your questions. Um, 
Obviously, citizen education is very important. I think that is something even the member states have to do because normally we, we set the targets. We only assess whether the member state is achieving those targets or not. How the member states achieve those targets, that, that is an internal issue. For example, when we talk about air quality, it's not the same problem everywhere. I have been discussing, for example, in some areas, air quality, where the biggest problem is industrial emissions. They have a number of industries, all the industries are emitting, so that is their problem. Other, even member states, whole member states, have still old heating um, and, and boiler system burning coal, burning wood, so that will be their main issue. Others might have transport, which is the main issue, for example, in, in Madrid. That is the main issue when it comes to air pollution. This morning I was discussing with my colleague and also with the mayor that we are there to support. And one of the tools that we have to support also member states in achieving waste targets, in achieving air pollution targets, is what we call peer-to-peer. -peer. And it is in the EIR, our environmental implementation review. Every year, we started this last year, every year we will come up with an assessment for every member state, how it is um, implementing all or most of the environmental legislation, including waste, including air, and we give them an assessment. You are doing well in this area, but you are lagging behind in the other area, and we have a tool we call peer-to-peer. -peer. If there is a member state which has a problem on waste management, and there is another member state which is successful in waste management, then we bring them together and we pay the, man the member state which is successful for its technical assistance or technical advice, which, is, which it gives to the other member states. It's called peer-to-peer. In some instances, that is not even needed. And I will give you an example for Spain. For example, Spain has got some 127 zones where air quality is being measured. And Spain has made a lot of progress in this. In fact, out of these 127, there are three zones where Spain is not delivering, but these three zones are zones where there is a high volume of population. If we talk about Madrid, Madrid's population is nine times bigger than Malta, my country, which is the smallest member state. So we cannot ignore, even though it's one zone, we cannot ignore that. But we don't need any member state to teach Spain how to do it. Because Spain did it successfully in a number of other zones. So if Spain can do it in one zone, why is it so difficult to do it in another zone? These are some of the things, obviously, that we are doing, we are pushing to help member states as well. At times, we have to use the carrot. At times, we have to use the whip. And again, on air quality, we had to use the whip against six member states because we're talking about pollutants which have had to be complied with in 2005 and in 2010. So imagine, we are late by 13 years and we are late by eight years. And I think uh, Frederick, mentioned the need for urgency. There is a lot of urgency. We cannot continue waiting and waiting. And that's why in January, I called nine member states to give them the, not an ultimatum, but we said, listen, we're not going to wait anymore. If you don't present measures, that will be assessed and that will convince the commission that these measures will 
bring results, then we have to go to the next steps. Thank you, if, Commissioner. I know I'm taking, but <laughs> can I, because Frederick mentioned the urgency. It's, it's can I urgent. make a comment? When it comes to urgency, normally most of us, we have a problem with what is happening. Biodiversity. We are losing biodiversity. So that's the main concern. My concern is not only that. My concern is that things are happening much faster than even the scientists are telling us. And I always, and for me, that is a bigger problem than the problem itself. Let me give you an example. In one of my um, master's assessments, I had to a module about the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. Some 10 years ago, scientists put a question, only a simple question. Will the Great Barrier Reef be affected by a future climate change? That was a question. Some five years ago, scientists from the question came with the answer, and they said, yes, the Great Barrier Reef is going to be very negatively affected, and by the year 2050, we will see changes, negative changes in the Great Barrier Reef. 2050. Last year, a British newspaper carried the headlines, half of the Great Barrier Reef is dead at the age of two million years. We are not even at the year 2020. We are 30 years before the scientific prediction, and things are already happening now. So I agree with Frederick. It's not only the measures, but the urgency to implement those, those measures. I'm sorry I took a bit, but this is a, a very important point. Yes, yes, I think. It was an important question. We had three more questions, but the waste uh, management issue is such a municipal competence that maybe some of you, Frederick, want to say something. Briefly, yeah. First, uh, absolutely agree about uh, the need for a frame framework. We have the commitment, but we need uh, the tools, uh, the transposition of directive uh, or of the circular economy directive is an urgency, and we are not doing that. Another thing, and linking to about the things of making things easy, we shouldn't underestimate the citizens. Example, first door to door uh, collection in a neighborhood in Barcelona. Eight thousand inhabitants. It's a small sample, but in 10 weeks we have passed just 10 weeks, and at the fourth it was already working, we have passed from the 19% of uh, recycling to 60.2%. Without uh, the instruments, the tools, the pressure instruments, the people in the neighborhood, we have uh, worked together with the Neighborhood Association, very interesting process, but from 19 to 62 to 900 kilos to 9,000 kilos every week. So we need the framework, we need the work on previous processes, we need more responsibilities. Uh, how collection and deposit, but we might we must make things easy recycling for the citizens. Uh, in Barcelona, we are into thirty six percent. We are stuck there. We have the zero waste strategy, reducing uh, waste. Uh, reusable uh, glasses in every uh, municipal festivities. Also, uh, 
put the spending, but we can make advances, but without a global uh, sympathetic framework about energy and other things is absolutely necessary because we are ready. We have already uh, prepared the contracts for uh, uh, garbage, uh, ever waste, uh, recycling. We must uh, learn in Catalonia. Uh, we have to the the, the plastic bag uh, legislation about paying for them is not enough. Uh, the government is not are not doing they are not doing their, their work we should uh, raise uh, the request somebody else about legislation i we must uh, speak about funding we have uh, already uh, implemented the organic issue but in our province is 50 50 percent of incineration and environmentally the big problem our big effort beyond firms that could pay for the devolution of uh, of uh, wrapping etc competencies, responsibilities are okay, but also funding for the local administrations about organic. We must focus on organic collection, separation, uh, consciousness raising. Uh, education is fundamental with uh, eco brigades in the neighborhoods, mouth to ear, working with neighborhood association, why it's important to separate ways for events and festivities, reusable glasses, etc. Ines, I totally agree with Barcelona. We have uh, all the obligations and sometimes we work into legal frameworks that are contradictory with many obligations and, and little funding. And in Madrid we have uh, there is uh, an intervention on our on our on our account. In, we must do a big effort. The city could make it, but before because of the treasury and the Montoro Ministry, we have a limitation on our spending capacity. I I wish I had uh, help. But funding should be a permanent obstacle, and I think that transition to sustainability shouldn't be considered as uh, it items considered by the fiscal uh, compact. If we don't understand that, even though in spite of having uh, funding rec resources like Madrid, we can develop our policies, which has a big, which are a big chance. So this is uh, crazy, a bit crazy. For us it's very important not to not to have contradic contradictory strategies. Spain has a system of competences which is very difficult to understand, but if there is an, a, a regional strategy like in Madrid that goes behind the needs it has that has to combine with the different municipalities is 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 crazy. You can't say that the only responsibility is for cities if there is no external funding and if re state regulation fundamentally is slow, doesn't work about its uh, reusing and uh, leads us to decisions and processes we don't want to do about air quality we we need re fiscal regulation non contractor regulation uh, treatment management uh, in our in the origin to go into circular economy and zero waste uh, and we're doing our best effort but i think the european union has to state a clear mandate 
to the member states about the responsi shared responsibility they have. Uh, uh, the next uh, question, I think, is about these uh, shared responsibility issues. David Orwell has the floor now for the Climate uh, Islands Alliance uh, platform. Please. I'll speak to you in English. It's easier for me and, and easier for you. Um, uh, so I'm David Howell from Alliance for the Climate. Uh, in Spain, a very broad civil society uh, coalition working on, on climate ambition in Spain. Up here by my side is, is Carlos uh, from one of the main trade unions in Spain. I'm from Sail Bird Life. NGO, which I think you know, you know well. Um, and uh, Commissioner, there's a growing citizen's demand for much better governance of EU institutions and better inclusion of environmental objectives uh, across the whole range of, of, of EU policies. One example might be the need for better integration of biodiversity, energy, agriculture, water and climate <coughs> policies, all, all of them uh, interlinked. Uh, in 2015, the, the European Environment Agency uh, sounded a, a, a warning about this, uh, looking towards uh, 2030, uh, and uh, 500,000 UK citizens supported the, uh, the uh, nature directives in the fitness check campaign. Last year, 250,000 European citizens called <coughs> for a greener, more social cap agriculture policy in the living land campaign. Uh, more recently, the EU Ombudsman criticised the Council for not respecting the EU treaties in its negotiations, lack of accessibility to those negotiations. And just yesterday, uh, there was, a, there was a, a legal challenge launched, the People's Climate Case, uh, in the courts, in the European General Court, for lack of EU climate ambition. Um, there is, I hope, some good news. But from civil society, we propose a solution, as, as you're asking for, uh, Commissioner. And that's the civil society's sixth scenario for the future of the EU, which was launched last year. And it asks that the EU institutions, strategy, budget, and legislation, not just the environmental part, respects and centers itself on the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. If this is the right approach, and this is the question for you, Commissioner. If this is the right approach, how should it be embedded practically in the way EU institutions work in EU legislation? And how can citizens' movements like the Alliance for the Climate uh, help that happen? Thank you. That's a, a very important question. It's a bit loaded because it, it has a, a very broad, but I will try to, to address it. First of all, and I'm only t talking about the EU level now. I'm not talking at the coordination at member state level. But let me talk about the coordination at EU level. I think when it comes to climate change, everyone recognizes the fact that the European Union was leading, it was the front, at the front, when it was on the negotiating table. And what the European Union is committed to is that we continue to have that lead, more importantly now, during the implementation phase. So we led negotiations, now we have to lead implementation. The integration or mainstreaming that you are talking about is already there. No, sorry. Just, just, uh, just a second, it's, it's, the sound is not... Uh... Okay, sorry about that. Um, when it comes to climate change mainstreaming in the whole MFF, we had 25, we had a commitment of 25% of the MFF going only on climate change. And we have a very good commissioner dealing with climate, and I think you all know him, Miguel, who's very, very ambitious. He got all or most of the credit for the European negotiating position on climate change. He is also making certain that the 25 or maybe more in the next MFF is not only their own paper, but is being implemented. 
What goes for climate change when it comes to mainstreaming also goes for the environment. Because you cannot, today as you said, you cannot separate environment, climate change, biodiversity, you cannot separate any of them. Um, so the mainstreaming is, is there and the integration from one of the So it's not Miguel's portfolio which is in charge. Every portfolio has got to contribute to the climate change mitigation adaptation. Not only in Europe, because our commitment, you mentioned the Agenda 2030, our European commitment on the SDGs is not a domestic commitment that we in Europe reach those objectives, but we are also committed to help other countries, especially developing countries, to attain, and that is where, with DEFCO, we are in continuous discussions to make certain that every one single euro which is being given to help developing countries is being spent to converge towards the SDGs. So we even have international mainstreaming when it comes to that. It is important that you mentioned how we can consolidate our actions, how we can, and we have to do that. There is no other way of doing it. Let me tell you why. Because very often we talk about the, the problem of air pollution and its effects, the problem of waste management and its effects, the problem of wastewater, of its effect. Very often we talk of these problems separately. But when you put them together, their compound effect is much, much higher. If I take wine, it will have an effect. If I take medicine, it will have an effect. If I take them both together, the effect, the compound effect will be bigger. But that also goes for solutions. And that is why we have to work together, because we have solutions towards climate change from the environment, from transport, from, I don't know, other areas. But the compound solution gives a better result as well. When we talk about climate change, and I share at times your disappointment, but I share it from a different perspective. I am also responsible for fisheries and maritime affairs. And oceans for me, the sea, in, in Brussels they tell me, ah, you must miss the sun in Malta. No, I don't miss the sun in Malta. I, I miss the sea in Malta, whether it's rough, whether it's calm, whether it's this, because I come from an island. It's not difficult to, it's difficult to get away from the sea not difficult to find the sea. And I was highly disappointed because when we were discussing the Paris Agreement on climate change, the oceans were not there. When we know that the ocean is the prime regulator of climate change. It absorbs 90% of the planet's heat, it absorbs 30% of the planet's carbon. It gives us 60% of the planet's <coughs> oxygen. It, it is home of more, for more than 60% of our biodiversity. And I often say that, man, we went from Earth to Moon bypassing the oceans. So I was, and if it were not for some side events, in Paris about oceans that we organized, they would have been even more than I go to Milan for the expo and the team was feeding the planet. And I went there, I said, I would like to see all beautiful pavilions, big pavilions, every country had a pavilion. And I said, I would like to see one or two pavilions which are highlighting the oceans contribution to feeding the planet, not one. All of them agriculture, agriculture, and how agriculture is contributing to feeding the planet, but the oceans. So I agree with, with, but I even want to go further than that. 
because we cannot leave the oceans when we talk about climate change. I mean, yesterday I was talking about renewable energy. When we talk about renewable energy and you ask any person, mention one example, two examples of renewable energy. They will mention either solar or wind. From the oceans, you can have tidal energy, wave energy, current energy, energy from different salinity, from different temperatures. So yes, we have to make certain that everyone is, is involved. On the CAP, yes, the CAP, as you know, is being discussed. discussed. There is the review of the CAP. We are discussing the CAP in the, for the next MFF, post-2020. And we are very much, myself and Miguel, are from environment and climate change, we are very much a part of, of that discussion because we have to make certain that the CAP contributes positively to environment. You are right, there were even audit um, comments that the greening was not happening. We were not happy with it, I said it, I said it to the farmers, and I told the farmers, in fact, I told my colleague, Phil Hogan, with whom I work very well and he understands, I said, listen, I was invited to address the farmers, and this is what I'm going to say. And I said, we are not after reducing the CAP by one single euro, what we are after is making certain that every single euro is contributing positively, not negatively, to the environment. If that is the case, I will be the first one to fight for a bigger budget. For, but we cannot have, and when I talk about agriculture, I'm talking in general, because in agriculture there are good practices and there are bad practices. But instead of subsidizing bad practices, I would rather reward good practices and put more money here than more money there. So this is the kind of discussions that, that we, are, we are having. And I know that most of the environmental law and legislation, if we talk about air quality, farmers benefit from it. If we talk about better soil, benefit. We we'll talk about better water, they benefit from it. If we want in June, 1st of June, we will be coming up with an initiative on, on pollinators. They will benefit. So environmental legislation benefits mostly farmers and, and agriculture. Um, when you say there is a la lack of action, if I understood, correction, if, if I understood correctly, lack, lack of EU climate action. There, I, I would like to disagree. Let me tell you why. Because, as I said, the European Union took the lead during the negotiations. We are pushing and taking the lead in, in implementation. We are helping third countries to achieve their mitigation, adaptation. This week, we had a meeting with the African Union, and again, they thanked the European Union. And considering what the other, I'm referring to America now, not to China, to Japan. I remember I was in Germany when uh, Trump, the next day that Trump with, withdrew from the Paris Agreement. And one journalist came up to me and he said, What's, what do you think about blah, blah. Well, I said, yesterday when we heard the news in Europe, we, were, we all went to bed sad and perplexed and a little bit disappointed. I said, but this morning the whole of Europe woke up more determined than ever before that if there is going to be a vacuum, we will fill it. And thank God, along with us, China, they are on the same wavelength. So, But this week we had Antonio Guterres in, in Brussels and we were discussing all this and he was thanking Europe for taking the lead in all this, because if I may ask one question, imagine if you were to take the European Union from the climate change program, what is left? 
So there, I think we, we shouldn't underestimate the role that the European Union and the future of, I agree with you as well, that the future of Europe has got, there is no other way, has got to be linked and tied and fully uh, synchronized with the Sustainable Development Goals. That we have all started because we, the two Vice Presidents, Sergei Katainen and Franz Timmermans, <coughs> they launched the future for a sustainable Europe, which is exactly on the SDG implementation. We are taking this on two parallel lines. First, our existing policies and legislation, how they are already contributing to the SDGs. And the future post-2020 EU policies, especially the eight environmental, uh, the EAP, the eight EAP action program, how it's going to reflect. For me, it shouldn't only reflect, it should be based on the, on the SDGs. On the SDGs, we are in some areas already doing a lot. If we're talking about circular economy, we are ahead almost of everyone else. If we are talking about oceans and bringing the oceans up to a global level, putting the oceans in the G7, in the G20, with the, our oceans conference we had in Malta last year, which was a huge uh, success. In some areas on the SDGs, we are already moving ahead. In other areas, as still more needs to be done. I mentioned biodiversity, for example. That is not an or, an, an only a European issue, but still, it doesn't mean that because others are not moving, we should relax and say, well, it's not our problem. So there is a lot going on. I don't know whether I answered your questions. I, I will, uh, thank you, Commissioner. What we are to do is to coger. What we are doing now is to pick up the two next question and then open a general uh, intervention uh, series. Um, we have just uh, 15 minutes before finishing Jose Manuel Delgado from the Royal Action Forum and then Mariana from Agroecological Madrid knowing that we have already spoken about the uh, common agricultural policy, but well, good morning. I speak uh, on behalf of the Ac Rural Action Forum. It's a platform of very heterogeneous uh, organization, environmental, rural, f uh, forestal, uh, trade unions. We work in favor of the rural areas. What are we doing here in the urban context? Well, first, we have been invited and we thank the organizers, but we think also that the relationship rural-urban is very important, sensibilizing uh, the rural uh, areas about that and food is uh, nutrition is very important and to have a sustainable uh, food is not just uh, about the intrinsic quality of the food or the production methods but also the origin of it and ab origine uh, we consider the origin from the point of view of natural spaces and this is my question the Natura network that uh, has one quarter of the Spanish territory has its value thanks to the management of agricultural cattle breeders that have kept sustainable production methods. In correspondence, uh, if we put that in a map, there is a coincidence between those zones with the most old in terms of population, the most depopulated areas in Spain. We consider that the link uh, of urban society to the rural areas through uh, nutrition, through food production, should 
consists of a sustainable food that identifies these spaces because that would allow uh, an economic future and a social fabric uh, for those spaces and a sustainable food and an awareness of the citizens, of the urban dwellers about these spaces. The policies of the Natura Network and the uh, Common Agriculture Policy depends on the will of the member states. In Spain, of the 17 regions, only four of them have developed the rural development uh, programs. So my question or my demand, my claim is, my, uh, has the Commission th thought about strengthening the Natura network, favoring uh, rural or cattle production or boot produ forest production that should be based about extensive uh, ecological agriculture through a regulation that allows uh, not just about quality, certain conditions in which that sustainable activity could be identified by the citizens, a sort of a label, and official to have official campaigns of uh, promotion of uh, uh, so that the urban dwellers, the citizen, can look for those uh, food, those uh, products that help the people managing those territories. Mariana, I am Mariana Zapat Pietro. I speak here on behalf of the agroecological space, which is a platform of collective that were for uh, food sovereignty in Madrid. We have two lines of action. On the one hand, strengthening the network of, N of uh, actors against the agro-industrial model, polluting one, and we, have, we want to have an influence of public policies, and we are participating in the food strategy in Madrid around the Milan Pact. From our platform, we would like to ask you about the uh, common agricultural policy because uh, it's unsustainable, because it uh, is helping the uh, polluting agro industries, because the use of fuel related, uh, oil related fuels because of the bias against uh, biodiversity and the great waste of food throughout the process. We should go for a local model based on a circular economy and, uh, and uh, narrow uh, marketing uh, marketing channels. How could the, pa the common agricultural policy change in this sense and how could the city be main actors into these changes through a sustain of the general environment and direction through uh, a support to those strategies? We are going into the final phase. We are going to try to uh, resume this may be the commissioner about uh, Natura 2000 about the common agricultural policy you may repeat what you have just said but uh, as a closing um, intervention maybe Frederick and commissioner if you want to say something about Natura 2000 oh because I'm taking a lot of time and I know my colleagues have a lot of contribution to give. But on Natura 2000, I think Spain is one of the member states with the highest amount of biodiversity. It is very um, rich when it comes to biodiversity. As you said, 27% of Spain is Natura 2000 uh, areas. The important thing about Natura 2000 sites is not to identify them and leave them unmanaged. In Europe I have this problem. In Europe they tell me we have 20% of Europe's land identified as Natura 2000 sites. But then I ask, okay, how many of that 20% are managed Natura 2000 sites? And they tell me about half of them. So for me the important thing is the management 
of the Natura 2000 site, not just. And here, I have to say that Natura 2000 sites allow sustainable activities, even economic activities, just so let alone if they are agricultural, sustainable agricultural, forestation, and so on. So I think that is something internal, how these sites are being managed. But I would encourage sustainable activities because I distinguish between preservation and conservation. Many of us do not distinguish, even I did not distinguish that. I had a, I had a, a subject, I had a thesis on village conservation policy. And I was mixing preservation with conservation. And my tutor said, you're doing the wrong thing because you have to decide either preservation or conservation. I said, but they are the same. No, go back, study the difference, and then come. Preservation is when you take something and you leave it, even if it's dying, you say, that is the natural process, I have to leave it, and you don't do anything. Nature is not like that. Nature, we have to help it to survive. Conservation means using what you have, and in the process, you enhance it, you strengthen it. So if there are activities in Natura 2000 sites that are not only sustainable, but that can improve the Natura 2000 sites, for me, that is conservation. And I think that is, that is very important. Uh, the CAP, I made some comments, you, but you mentioned one thing, and again, I fully support any sustainable agricultural policy, but I cannot support bad practices. You mentioned the local food systems. I think that is already being supported by, by the current rural development. I, I think you are referring to the possibility of farmers selling directly to consumers. I think that is a very good, a very important thing. I know that this is flourishing all over the European Union. It's ha it has a number of benefits, not just for the farmers, because they have a better say on the price of the, but also the customers, the consumers, because they are getting more fresh consumers. Environmentally, it reduces the carbon footprint of, of the whole process. So yes, I, I, this is something that from an environmental point of view, I would support very much. Okay. Now, orderly, maybe starting by Frederick. Some reaction to the questions, uh, some contributions, uh, because we have only two minutes. About the development of the two 2030 goals, I would like an offer both to the Alliance and the Commission. 25 big cities, including Madrid and Barcelona, we have bet uh, uh, about this horizon of climate neutrality 2050, Barcelona, our climate plan co-produce poses 50% uh, reductions of emissions and also the topics of 2030 and a long-term plan uh, like Paris, New York, Helsinki, Madrid, if the European Union weakens uh, its pressure or has no muscle enough uh, to go on leading, like the Commissioner said, you must count on the cities. We are at the avant-garde in this battle. How should we improve these connections? Because we are into a context in which social, uh, civil society, the Climate Alliance and other actors and the Commission and the state. And here are the cities, here we are. This is clear. We must meet uh, the Paris uh, Agreement. Let's see what happens in this year. We assume that our efforts are not enough. Uh, many cities we are working to meet those goals. Here we are. The, the, this, I would say, to the Commission, to the State, to the Alliance. As uh, 
it's, it is that same, same true, but for um, Barcelona, it's very important what happened to the Natura 2000 network. In Barcelona, in 18% uh, of Barcelona's municipality is a Colcerola Park, which belongs to the Natura 2000 network. We are working intensively to have a model change about conservation. We want to promote agriculture in those areas, so this coordinated effort is important. And from the cities, we also have our job to do, in this case, inside the territory. But I absolutely agree about this uh, impulse. We have our own uh, strategy for food uh, sovereignty and responsible consumption. We are working about uh, urban agriculture. We're a bit late about that. but. We must uh, uh, have a proximity production and introduce it in the city. Here we will have a good connection and we can work better about uh, promoting proximity consumption. We are developing a project to strengthen Mercabarna, the big um, market in Barcelona, to have a space for uh, ecological and proximity agriculture. So all those uh, measures that would, could come from uh, Europe, we think, it we think it important on our work as cities beyond the fact that we have a territory belonging to Natura Network. It's also about consumption. As uh, consumers, we must promote this modal change of consumption patterns in which uh, food sovereignty and proximity agriculture become hegemonic. We have a big job to do uh, as cities. Uh, so in the end, I think that what uh, you have uh, said shows uh, this uh, necessary uh, scale work uh, and collaboration. So both uh, the Commission, European Union, states, cities, regions. I think the last point uh, should be that we must find good spaces uh, for the cities uh, to exchange. We are already organizing networks, but uh, we need a, m a more fluid uh, a relationship with the Commission, with the European Union uh, bodies, and cities are a connection point, are a meeting point, and many of the environmental measures uh, coming from the European Union are made possible if they are implementable in cities, otherwise they won't be possible. Well, briefly, for the cities to develop the food strategies, we must have a legal framework al uh, allowing that. When we go to a supermarket, we see the tomatoes coming from the Netherlands, lambs coming from New Zealand, and for uh, citizens, they don't look at the labels, but they don't understand, they don't go to the details about how can we stop that. Valladolid is available. We are belong to the uh, agroecological network. We speak of the three Bs, Vitoria, Valladolid, Valencia. We have this, under this mandate, we are working on these issues. I think there are three main axes. Education, going to the schools, to high school, so that children understand that vegetables don't grow in supermarkets. This seems obvious, but we see a lack of knowledge about where food comes from. This uh, first concern must be introduced uh, since uh, uh, f uh, the children, for ch uh, beginning by children, uh, local uh, change. Uh, we have monthly ecological market. We have asked for funding, applied for funding uh, to our region. There are local uh, consumption groups. That complicity, that uh, 
solidarity of the public administration to movements, social movements that were already there. Now it seems uh, trendy, but consumption networks, urban gardens, self-managed managed in many cities by elderly people in the schools, Everything should be put to work and the administration should accompany those citizens' initiatives uh, that are uh, meeting many obstacles about soil, about uh, the coordination between municipalities is very important. We have a tendency to see an antithesis between uh, the countryside and the city, but we need each other. The municipalities around Valladolid, we have many land, Many municipalities have developed the brick policy, but now into these coordination policies, those lands should be kept for urban garden and to enlarge the green surfaces that have been brutally uh, reduced. And to finish, we have a, we should have a longer term look, but in electoral periods, you want to push many changes and you want change, but changes should be uh, shared by the citizens and we should arrive to a consensus, but they should be inevitable, longer term, but inevitable. People should consider this as good sense, as, as something that makes sense. They shouldn't be so controversial. The more consensus the easiest will be or and if there is the if there is consensus the more difficult would be to uh, finish or to cancel those policies in the future if the citizens agree if the citizens uh, citizens have pushed these things uh, well with with this example about food strategy i finish thank you i'm so glad to participate here because it helps to learn good practices and share errors or mistakes by all cities. Now, last uh, word is for Madrid. I would join the reflections of both uh, Maria and Barcelona uh, in the sense that uh, the role of cities of uh, already built networks and the accessibility and the offer to relate to each other, to explain, to search for alternatives to be specified into, your, into strategies and to match with the uh, European Union strategies that sometimes we have difficulty to develop. We are lucky and to us it's been, it, it has been very important that there are many organizations, climate alliances, collectives, associations with a huge creativity, huge uh, potential that contribute, that r require, that demand and that contribute also with participation because cities have the capacity to act in network and that complicity uh, will have a say about transformation. But I would like to finish saying that sustainability, also economic sustainability, has to do with the local context and social and local economy. And for us, for the cities, I think it's very important that the European Union there, are, there have been many advances about that, should recognize the role of social economy, the important role of local development uh, that social economy has. Uh, it should be translated into the removal of the obstacles for that there have been these uh, obstacles about European contracts, there should be room for the contribution of social economy about the big processes of transformation. I say this, that maybe in Madrid, because we are under, uh, under attack, a major attack, 
to the participation of the social economy in public policies, in management, in contracts. Uh, we should consolidate that space that has a key role in transformation. They should have uh, room, space and, and support from the European Union. This uh, would make us good, the support of the European Union about this social economy, working about waste and other important issues. So thank you to the audience, thank you to the panelists, of course to the interpreters. We never thank them. Thanks, thanks a lot. Vamos a, vamos a hacer ahora. Now uh, we have we're gonna have a little pause, uh, 15 minutes, and then we go back to the hall. We are gonna have a pair of presentations about different economic, environmental scenarios for. 2030 and 2050, please, uh, a quarter past uh, noon, we see each other.